This episode is brought to you by DIY Gift Kits. Go to DIYGiftKits.com, link in the description, and get yourself a hot sauce making kit right now. I'm Jackie Martling. You're listening to The Anthony Rogers Show. Very nice guy, or at least he seems to be. He could be a serial killer. But what difference does it make to me? I just like to do uh, show business. I'm Jackie the Joke Man Martling, formerly The Howard Stern Show, and I know your mother very well. <laughs> You are now listening to the best show in the universe, The Anthony Rogers Show. You probably wish that this was your show, but it's not. It's The Anthony Rogers Show. Tell all of your friends to listen to this show. Welcome back to the greatest show in the entire universe. Uh, today we have a legend in uh, radio business, comedy, um, uh, several other things. Uh, Jackie the Joke Man, Marlene from uh, Howard Stern and several other things. How are you doing, brother? I, I'm good, except for the fact legend always makes me feel a thousand years old, but that's okay because I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> no, legit, man. I mean, I think you're one of the most successful, you're on one of the most successful radio shows of probably all time, let alone my generation. Well, it wasn't my show, but I certainly helped. Now, I, should, I don't think I know you. Should I know you? No. I'm, I'm, and where, where am I talking to? Where, where are you? I mean, I see the beautiful island behind you, but I'm sure that's a painting. <laughs> yeah, I'm in, I'm in uh, Missouri, the center of the United States. Uh, uh, God's, ah. God's favorite state, I think. According to God, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, um, how, like, dude, I, I can't believe you're slumming it and being on this show, honestly. This is a show is like a lot, well, way beneath you, man. I, I, thought you, I thought you were better than this, honestly. No, there is no beneath. <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, you know, with the COVID, everybody has so much time, and I, and I just love chatting. And, you know, every time I do shows like this, even if it only goes out to five people, it always winds up hitting somebody It's like, Holy Christ, I remember Jackie from his band. I remember Jackie from college. I remember Jackie from Florida. And I always give out my email address, which is jokeland at AOL.com. And people are like, I can't believe I heard you on the show and I was stopping by this. And so it's, it's totally selfish. You know, like I, I used to say, how many listeners you got? But people used to say, well, I'm on Spotify and Apple and Creed and and, 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 and list all these goddamn places. I say, all right. How many people are going to hear it? Six, you know. So <laughs> we'll get to so six. Uh, we'll get to six soon. We're trying. We're trying to build to that. You know, uh, I got my mom listening to it so far. I'm trying. I'm trying to get five other people. If you listen to it, we're already. To, you know, we're almost there. You know. Well, I know your mom. So I know your mom. <laughs> are you? Are you in witness protection, or, or why are you dressed like an idiot? <laughs> I think I'm. I think I'm just an idiot. Like, uh, that's the. That's the worst part about it. Like, uh, it's just how we dress. You know, as idiots. It can't be cold out there, can it? No, not not in this fake beach. This fake beach is pretty warm. Um, it's funny you brought up my mom. My mom's actually a huge fan of us, uh, Howard Stern, and like everything you guys do, man. Like uh, the show, not not the person, you know. Like like a uh, huge fucking fan. Probably introduced me to radio, actually. Like like more or less. Like uh, like she she fucking loves your shit, man. Well, first of all, mom, the, the state should come pick you up and take you to jail. But if they don't. Uh, send me an email with your street address and I'll send you an autographed copy of my autobiography and I bet you get a big kick out of it. It's jokeland at AOL.com. And uh, is it your real mother? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not, yeah, not my fake mother. <laughs> That's a funny concept, man. That's funny, dude. So what, oh, like, what, are, what are you up to these days, man? Like, I've been, like, uh, like, like, are you back on, when are they letting you back on Stern? What's going on with that? I'll never be back on it. He'll never have me back. If he ever had me back on, and he got two phone calls where people said, oh, man, it's so great to hear Jackie again. Uh, that would ruin his decade. So <laughs> that ain't happening. But uh, you should call you know, him. it's so funny. It's so funny. The amount of, the amount of fans <clears throat> is just staggering because it, I, I get emails from people that weren't even born when I left, by the time I left the show. Like I, I get emails oh, wow. from 20-year-old guys saying, <laughs> you know, I got the greatest email from a guy. He said, Jackie, uh, I'm from Toronto. I started listening to the Stern Show in 2007, and instantly it was my favorite thing in the world. And I got so into it, I started Googling and looking back at the old shows. And he said the shows from the 90s, he said it was like having a new favorite band and then finding out that their earlier albums 
were much better. <laughs> yeah. I thought, what a great That's comedy. True. You know, you know yeah. I, the, the, the comedy clubs are just about to start up. I don't really, you know, I go around and I do a theater here and a theater there, and I got a bunch of stuff booked, but not starting until the end of June. And who knows if they're going to come off, if they're going to be full, or whether the pandemic's going to come back. The main thing I do, which is really fun, I just did like three or four of them before I did this. <clears throat> is, have you ever heard of Cameo.com? Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been doing a lot of those, you know, because I was made for it. People say, hey, you know, uh, my mother loves radio. She loves dick jokes. She loves poop <laughs> jokes. And she's turning 30, 40 years old. And then whatever somebody asks, I go right down to bullet points and hit on all of them <clears throat> and, you know, do a three or four minute video. And I don't make a ton of money, but I do a lot of them. And it's just, it's almost like, it's like my methadone. It gets my laughs. You know, I get in my laughs and get to tell my jokes and I really enjoy them. You know, I've got like, you know, hundreds of them. Um, if somebody wants to book it, it's cameo.com slash Jackie Martling. And if you're a fan of jokes, if you go on there, <clears throat> they have like six old ones that, you know, to, to like demonstrate what I do. And there's so many jokes on each one. You can go there and not spend a penny <clears throat> and, and hear a gazillion jokes, you know. And then most of them are pretty foul, you know. Have you thought about starting OnlyFans? I, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it's like it's like this thing where girl. Uh, oh, oh, that's 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 the uh, that's this porno, right? Right, right, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not going to suck anybody's cock just to make a few bucks. Yeah, not for money. Like <laughs> no, for for fun. <laughs> yeah, it's unethical do, for money. <laughs> no. Why? And now is it, that is really all porn people, right? Or is it everybody? Well, it seems like it, but, but I mean, it's a market you could probably like a person like you could probably swoop though if you have a fan, like you have a huge fan base. So I think like um. But I think people are trying to evolve. They're trying to evolve it to another social media. I think honestly, like uh, I, I was half-ass joking, but I, but I do think that um, I do think honestly, somebody anyway, the fan base can make money off it. Honestly, yeah, you know, almost every media ever, whether it was uh, kinescopes or movies or ra not not radio so much, but like uh, VHSs and Betamax and three quarter inch everything. Porno drove every beginning media, every one, you know, DVD, Blu-ray, all that stuff, you know. Credit cards porno even. Leads, yeah, porno leads the way and then everything follows, you know, follows suit. You know, that's why I, I've decided to go into porn. And <laughs> I saved the announcement for today. And, uh, and if your mom just wants to give me a, an email, uh, maybe she could be, she could be uh, uh, what is it? What, what do they call a person in, in Africa? Not cust. Customer number one. What was it? Victim number one. I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, so every time I try and think of you know, it ruins every joke. You go to start something and then all of a sudden your mind goes blank. You know, who knows? <clears throat> I, st I still laugh. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Why not? You know, so are you a comic? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. I, I haven't done anything lately. Like you said, the COVID thing. But yeah, before COVID, I was doing a lot of shows and stuff. In Missouri or around the country or uh, country, and I I got into Canada a little bit, like Vancouver and stuff. Not not like not the whole. St I want to tour more, like through Canada, but yeah, America mostly. It's you know it's it's really funny because it sucks, and then uh, when you haven't done it in a while, you you nostalgic. You know, I just got a couple calls to do a bunch of stuff in Florida, and I I'm. I'm I'm excited about it, and I know the second I get on the plane, I'll be like, "What the fuck are you doing, man? This is you know, <laughs> sitting there and, and you know, I'm from the days when you didn't have an iPad and a cell phone and a computer. I mean, you sat around all day like watching bad TV or going <laughs> to the mall. I mean, very few comics. I you know, the few com maybe one out of a hundred comics would actually sit there and try and write material. You know, most people just killed time until it was time to go get drunk and do your show, you know. But now with, with the iPads and, and iPhones, it must be a breeze. It's just like being at home, you know. I think, I think you literally nailed it. Yeah, I think um, allegedly I just sit in my car getting fucked up the whole time before my set. Like, that's pretty. That's 100% what the job is. Like, yeah. it's, so um, uh, with comedy, uh, like speaking of comedy, like uh, how long have you been in comedy, I guess? Like, that's a while. Like the last time I worked St. Louis – was at a place called the Funny Bone, Westport and Plaza. between shows we walked out, and I guess there was a theater, yeah, uh, yeah, in the same area, 
<clears throat> we bumped into uh, Jay Leno, Larry Miller, and Yakov Smirnoff. And the three of them were appearing in the theater. I think it was like 1982 or something like that. That's crazy, and, man. And, and then I heard that the guy was ripping people off, and he booked me in Knoxville because there was another Funny Bones in Knoxville. And I said, I want to get paid before I go. And he got all insulted, but I made him pay me. And, uh, you know, I never worked for him again. And then like a year later, he was out of business because, he would, you know, they, in those days, it was like the Wild West. You'd do your shows, and at the end of the week, they'd say, uh, you know, you say, well, you know, I want to get paid. Well, I won't have the money till tomorrow. I'm leaving tonight, <laughs> you know. No, yeah, no, venue owners are some of the most skeezy motherfuckers I've ever met in my life. Some of the coolest and most, like, scandalous I've met in my life. Yes, and uh, so many of them, what's really sad is so many of the sleaziest, scummiest ones were the most fun to hang with. Yeah, you know, those were the get away with it, yeah. Dealers. I wasn't a cokehead, but the coke dealers and the coke addicts, because there were gir always girls hanging all over, not for the owner, but for the coke, and, you know, so... It, it, Wild days, wild days. In the early 80s, you know, like Giggles in Tampa and the Funny Bones and, nice. and uh, you know, the, the places in Miami. I know I didn't work. I worked California very little, <clears throat> you know. And then when I got on the Stern Show, I started doing theaters, which was, you know, really great. I wasn't really a good – not that I wasn't good, but I wasn't as well-known enough – I wasn't well-known enough as a comic to do, like, the Chicago Theater and the State Theater in Denver – but from the popularity of the show, I got to go do them. And, of course, you know, I killed when I got the gig. But it's, uh, it's tricky. You know, you, you got to have a name that will pull people. And being on that show was like, it was magic. You know, absolute magic, you know. No, I think, I think people listening to it felt the same thing. Do you, still, do you still get nervous before you do a set or anything? Do you get, do you get that nervousness right before, <laughs> like that, that five minutes before? It's the same. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not nervousness. It's anticipation. Okay. Because, you know, it's funny. I always, always thought, well, it, eventually it'll go away. But what happens is in the beginning, you're going up and you want to do good. But as you start getting known, like when you get to the point where you're making 10 grand for a show, you can't just go out there and get away with it. <clears throat> you got to go out there and kill. And, not, you know, you always worry. And I used to always worry, like, how many people are in the middle of a, a joke and yell, Baba Booey, and fuck you up, you know, and uh, – <laughs> so it, it, there's just anticipation and then you go out and you tell your first joke and get some big big laugh and then you're done you know gilbert Gottfried always says you know five minutes before showtime he hopes that uh the owner will just be handing the money before the place burns down and he doesn't have to do his show you know which <laughs> i totally got chris rock said you don't get paid for doing the show you get paid for the 20 minutes before the show so there's there's the answer to you you know because yeah, everybody I never met a comic, you know, except a few assholes who are like, well, I'm just going to go out there. I'm going to be fantastic. They're going to love me. Nobody, everybody's like, oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. You know. <laughs> Survival you know, mode. Like, yeah, I know. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like bad, you know, it, it's bad karma to be, be cocky. You know, it's uh, better, better to, to worry about what's going to happen, you know. And plus, we're all assholes. Like that doesn't help, you know. <laughs> No, it's I was. That's funny. I was just wondering because I thought the same thing. Like uh, I was, I've been doing it in, uh, about five years, and I thought the same thing. Like uh, that maybe you'd go away, but um, I, like yeah. After I think you nailed it after the first joke. So I guess everybody feels like that. That's interesting. <laughs> I just didn't. I just didn't know if it ever because I, I think it is about the first joke, and then like even if the first joke doesn't like doesn't kill, you have like a way out of it to kill. You know what I mean? It's it's like even if a joke bombs, you can still make that funny. Like like and that, yep. that's that's like the fucking key. I think is is like just just fucking roll with the punches. You know. Yeah, and the more you do it, the more, you know, the more escape hatches you have. You know, exactly. one, of the, one of the worst things that ever happened to me uh, was very early on. Because when you're, when you're just starting, you know, like when they announce, here's Bob Hope, like they're all, they already love him. They're, all, they're already laughing. They're, he doesn't have anything to prove. All he's got to do is be funny. And uh, <clears throat> I think, oh, it would be so great like, when you get famous, you don't have to worry about anything. And I went away with Rodney and we went, Rodney Dangerfield, and we went to Las Vegas and we got in the limo and we pulled up to the Aladdin where he was working. And it was during a gas strike in 1980. And we walked in. <clears throat> the first thing he did, he ran up to the, ticky, <clears throat> the ticket window and said, how are sales? Are we selling tickets? How are we doing? <laughs> I'm like, holy fuck, it never goes away. It never goes away. You're still worrying, still worrying about putting asses in the seats. Still worrying, and I'm like, 
holy shit, I should just bail now. You know, you, you're thinking at some point you're going to get the golden ring and it's like, everything's fine. They laugh. You get paid a lot. You never have another worry. It never happens. It just doesn't exist. You know, that's super interesting actually to think about as a, as a community. That's super interesting. And yeah, I think there's no finish line. We, we got to keep doing stuff. It's like, I mean, somebody 20 years old could be funnier and have a better idea coming out. You know, it's like, it, it, like these, like, I mean, the next generation, next generation, just over and over again, you know, it's like, I, I, I again, have a time stamp and like, like kind of stand out. And I think like, I don't know. I, I think I'm at the beginning of that ride. I think, I think I, I put in a, a decent amount of time at the beginning of that ride, but uh, it, it's kind of interesting as the show started picking up, you know, it's like some at the very, very beginning of, of uh, I mean, I've been doing it for a while, but at the very beginning of it working. <laughs> I, I get it, man. You know, it's so funny. Just imagine how many generations I've seen come and go, you know, like and I've done good and done bad. But then when I got in the Stern show, it was just a gradual up. And next thing I knew I was a millionaire, you know, from radio and, but, but also from stand up. <clears throat> but people are always like, Hey, what do you think? And I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about 10 years ago. People say, Hey, what do you think of the new comics? And I'm like, well, to me, the best new comic is Chris Rock. And meanwhile, he, he was new in 1985. I, you know, I just don't pay attention. Why most, you know, you get in trouble, but most people I watch that, you know, they do everything right. You know, they're wild and crazy and, you know, offensive, but they, but they leave out the part about being funny. <laughs> you know, I'm not a good comic. I just tell stupid jokes and laugh and have fun. The only thing I don't do anything except make people laugh for an hour. But to me, that's our job interview. That's, that's the first thing you're supposed to do. You know, people come up and say, that's the hardest I ever laughed for an hour in my life. That's all I want. I'm doing old jokes. I'm having fun. I'm doing what I did until I quit music at the age of 31. You know, I'm just having fun and sharing it. <clears throat> I'd always shared it. Now I share it on stage. And some people are like, well, not anymore because I got, I got big. And, uh, but people are like... Uh, well, that guy just tells jokes. Yeah, because people are laughing. If they weren't laughing so fucking hard, I wouldn't be telling them, you know? Yeah, you, so, seem, like, you seem authentic. You seem like you're yourself really well, and I think, that, I think that's what's good about, like, a lot of the people on that, uh, like, that came from Howard Stern. I think, I think the authenticity kind of goes through, and then you just connect with people when you're yourself, you know what I mean? Like, like uh, I think that's true. And I think anybody that's funny gets canceled at this point. I mean, you have these, like, huge, huge funny, com I mean, I think, well, I don't know if they consider themselves so comedians, but, like, that Milo guy, that was like that, 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 that gay Republican, like a uh, guy who just fuck with everybody. Like, like, like they just get deleted. You know I mean? Even Trump, I think was like, the, was a fucking comedian and then, like, as, as president. And like, and he gets, I mean, they, they cancel everybody, man. You're not even allowed to be funny anymore. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and it's, you know, but that the, the pendulum will swing back. It just I, will. You know, I like so I, I, ever since the beginning, <clears throat> I've been dirty, but not crazy dirty. And I've always been offensive, but not crazy offensive. You know, uh, like uh, the word cunt might, pop up pop up once in my act and maybe never and maybe some you know some polish and some jewish and some black less now than ever but i never use the really offensive words and the really really offensive stuff but but it's funny it, you know it <clears throat> you know you say a guy's jewish and people think cheap and you say polish they think stupid and it's like it's so unfair because it's got nothing to do with those people and now I'm at the age where I'm old. I can just say two guys did this and they just do something stupid. And people realize it can be because they're old or stupid or whatever they are. It doesn't matter who they are. You just leave out the two guys were doing this and it's still just as funny, you know, but it, but time, it took time for that, you know, like the blonde, you know, the Polish joke, we're getting the blonde jokes. And, you know, when I first realized all this crap was, uh, I wasn't a comic. When I went away to college, I had always told jokes my entire life. And uh, I go out to college and everybody's telling Polish jokes. And there was no such thing as a Polish joke in, in the 60s uh -huh. in New York. It was, all, <clears throat> it was all Italian jokes. But then you go out there, it was the same exact jokes. And then you find out that in Texas, they're Aggie jokes. And in Canada, they're new feature. It's the same thing. It's like, a, you know, a gentle attack on maybe people that are supposed to be a little, you know, less with it. And, it, and it's all bullshit anyway. So <laughs> it, you, you realize the parallels to everything, and it's, but nothing, nothing's going to go away. Nothing's going to go away. You know, it's uh, like jokes. I tell people when the world ends, uh, when the Republicans successfully get us demolished and, and the whole planet is demolished, the only thing that's going to be left are going to be cockroaches, and my jokes <laughs> because they're not going anywhere. They've been here since Adam and Eve and they're not going anywhere. It's that simple, you know, so.
That's a good point. I think like, like jokes do a lot of things for people. I think there's definitely a necessity for that in American society society <laughs> alone. I mean, have you, have you found your, um, your materials like changed or evolved as you get older and stuff? Or have you found anything like that? Like, <clears throat> so many of the jokes in my act are jokes that I told in like 1958. So I was, you know what I, mean? so I was wondering, yeah. Uh, no. <clears throat> I mean, but they, they come and go. I t I'll tell a joke I heard last week or I, I find old things that aren't that funny <clears throat> and switch them around and make them funny. And then people will come up and tell me a joke. And it's so funny because I know that I'm the one that put it back in circulation and made it funny. Huh. But, you know, you don't say, oh, well, I, I wrote that because I didn't write it. I just, you know, revamped it or whatever, you know. But when you do this long enough, you know, I'd, I'd find jokes that were so, such definitive Rodney Dangerfield jokes. And then you find it in a joke book from 1850. Uh, it's not that anybody stole it. It's that somebody said, you know what? That brick will go perfect in this walk. Yeah, there's, you know so, there's only so much shit funny. You know, that totally makes sense. There's only so many things that are funny. Like. Right. And it's, uh, I mean, it goes on and on. Like, of course, in the days of Adam and Eve, there weren't microwave jokes. <laughs> but if you, if you go to the root of them, the, you know, I, I've always found it really, really interesting. You know, in fact, I'm, I'm just starting to work on, uh, I found a guy with a lot of money, thank God, and we we're going to work on a documentary. You know, if I say this, you know, the, I, I, I keep telling myself not to say it because somebody's going to jump on it because it's such an obvious thing. <clears throat> but we're just going to do a documentary called Jokes. And everybody uh -huh. is interested. Everybody's just interested. And it, I told the guy, I think it's going to wind up being a 12-part cable series because it just is, it's so, it's so, f and the bottom line is it's, it's still funny. You can't get pedantic. You know, if people start talking about comedy, you just want to shoot yourself. There's uh, nothing less funny unless uh, you just keep uh, fucking around and, and say something funny once in a while. That's, you know, like I'll go on Gilbert Gottfried's podcast and we talk about jokes and we laugh, but then you throw in a cock joke to make sure the, <clears throat> to keep the, the skillet buttered. You know what I mean? No, I, def so. I definitely agree. Yeah. That's interesting. And so uh, were you one of the original members of Howard Stern? Like the, the show? Um, it depends on what you call original. Howard went to Washington, D.C., uh, and he made them make a deal that he can bring a guy from Connecticut. So Fred okay. Norris went to Howard's uh, show in Washington, D.C., and then some woman uh, who knew Robin <laughs> Quivers said, can I, can I put this girl, try her on your show? So it was Howard and Robin and Fred, and then he got fired. And I was working at Garvin's in Washington, D.C., and the owner said to me, hey, this crazy guy just got fired from uh, uh, whatever, the D.C. 101 in Washington. He said, but he's going to New York to WNBC, and I know that he would love you. So at the time, I had three albums out, and I was sending them all over the place, three homemade albums. <clears throat> and I sent him to Howard, and he called me up and uh you want to come in and hang out on the air? And I went in, and so it was me and Howard and Robin and Fred, and we laughed for four hours. And he said, wow, you're a pistol. Why don't you come back next week? So I came back once a week for three years. Okay. And then, and then we went to mornings, and he, I was on full time, and I was writing jokes for him a mile a minute, and we went to Pluto. So, yeah, I was definitely a founding father. You know what I mean? No, I would consider that. I was just wondering. I was just wondering if you, thought, yeah, I would consider you that too. But um, that's just interesting. And um, like, did you know along the at the beginning that this was like magic, or did the magic like I kind of like happen over a period of no, time? Or, no, no. Uh -huh. Everybody asks that because um, I wasn't a radio guy. I wasn't even hardly a comedian. I just told jokes, and I was a musician, so I had worked in a studio, so I knew I could make my own records. So six months after I was in comedy, I was selling my own album. I mean, nobody except for the except for like, uh, you know, the Robert Kleins and the George Carlins, nobody had a comedy album. It was a big deal to have, you know, because you had to have a record company and somebody hires you, blah, blah, blah. But I made it myself. It was literally homegrown, you know, edited the tape and got the money and sent it away and got it made. So when I sent the three albums to Howard, he was very impressed. It was like, you know, who is this guy? He's got three albums. But when I went on, it was a really, really great time. But at the time, I didn't know that that was the norm or it wasn't the norm. I know when I sit around with four people and we fuck around, it's always a lot of fun. So that wasn't, a, it wasn't an anomaly to me, uh, whether it was radio or whatever it was, it was the green room. You know, we're sitting there fucking around, having a great time. 
uh, it wasn't until in retrospect when everybody started trying to recreate what we had, what Howard had created, you realize that it, it, it really was Dorothy going to Oz. You know, he, fa- he, got, he found Fred, then he found Robin, then he found me, and all of a sudden we had this. We're going to take a break for a second to talk about one of our sponsors, Freeze Pipe. Freeze Pipe is a glass hand pipe featuring a freezable glycerin coil. When smoke passes through the frozen chamber, it instantly becomes cooled by over 300 degrees to a chilly temperature resulting in, in a better time. Go to the link in the description and get a discount and get a Freeze Pipe right now. You know, and they broke my balls for 20 years about calling us the Beatles of radio. But like it or lump it, we were the Beatles of radio, you know, and it was uh, and it just got better and tighter and funnier and crazier and wackier. And, uh, you know, it was so after like a year, you know, Howard and Robin didn't really do interviews. And I was always getting interviewed because people want to know what's going on. And every every goddamn interview would say, you know what, you guys have a great show. But how long can it last? I'm like, I, I don't know. And then three years later, this is a great show, but how long can it last? I don't know. And then, you know, <laughs> how it wrote a book and we got syndicated to LA and then the pay-per-views and then the movies. It kept, you know, people kept saying, oh, it's great, but how long can it last? I must have been asked that question every two years for 20 years, you know. That's and it was, it was magic, you know. And it, and it, it is. It not, not only was it really fun and really funny, but there was no competition. Most guys on the radio, like, you know, I go on these radio shows and, it, you know, the, the people are so dull. They have me on and, like, <laughs> they love it because I just get going and, like, holy shit. People are like, wow, you should have that guy again, you know. It's, it's, it's a weird thing because no, who, who the fuck goes into radio? Nobody goes into radio. At least they didn't used to. You know, <laughs> it, it wasn't a money situation. You know what I mean? You made a few dollars and then they fired you and sent you three states over, you know. And uh, he, he made it into a, a big time business, you know? No, it's awesome. I, th- I think all of you guys made it, made it possible. I think it's, it's a very interesting kind of thing. And, and I, I think you nailed it with radio. I, was, I, I started this podcast on Texas radio and got fired twice. You know, it's like, it's just, it's, uh, I mean, they don't like, they don't like anything that's good, really. They just, I mean, the more boring you are, the better than like those push it more. And, and like, uh, what, what, what do you got? What do you think of like podcasts in general? Like, uh, so you, probably, you do a lot of them, but I mean, uh, what, what do you, what do you think of like it now being like a home thing rather than me being in, like, or, or like us being in like some huge, like expensive fucking studio where our house is like, what do you, what do you think about that transition? Like, you know, it's, it's what if the whole thing started happening, uh, well, especially after the pandemic, I did a bunch of these Zoom things where they'd hire you for a lot of money. And I started telling people, look, I'll take your money. But, you know, you have six people, it's fine. But when you got 12 people and then there's another screen with another 12 or nine, and you want the mics open so you can hear the reaction, and all of a sudden the guy's ordering pizza and another guy's yelling at his dog. I'm like, you know, this, this, this doesn't, this does not work, does not work. The podcast I started doing right away because because uh, I enjoyed them, you know, and I still do a lot of them, uh, and a lot of them like this. A lot of the one-on-one Zoom is fine, you know, because we could go forever and ever and ever. And everybody's like, "Why don't you do your own?" It's funny because I, I'm going to a studio tomorrow for the second time. This guy has this really nice studio, and you know they have uh, they're. They're filming, not filming it, but they, you know, they're videotaping it and recording it. And I, you know, I have a screen behind me and I can put pictures and it's, it's such a wide open thing and I can do anything I want. But the bottom line is there's nothing more fun than sitting here and having you say, so Jackie, how much fun was the Stern show? You know, if I'm hosting, I can't ask myself. And, you know, most people, they don't have a lot to say, you know, not, not stuff <laughs> Not stuff that's, you know, my stuff is very interesting to radio and, and anybody in show business because it was such a phenomenon that everybody knew us, you know. So asking other people, it sounds, it sounds so egocentric, but, but I don't know, you know, I have a, a, a really good old friend coming on tomorrow and I'm thinking that will work. That will work because we'll talk about the beginning of the, when God created heaven and earth and, and uh, comedy on Long Island. And that'll really be fun. But, the, you know, you know, I don't, I don't need to own the ball field. I want to just go play ball and then kick my mitt and go home. You know what I mean? Having a podcast is a whole thing. How many people did you get and how many listeners? How many how did you post it here? Is it posted there? Who's paying attention? You know, it's a, you know, it was a big – it was a can of worms two years ago. Now, 
you know, you can't hiccup without three new podcasts starting. You know what I mean? So who yeah. can, I, I can't tell who has, you know, whoever calls, you know, I'm at the point where I say yes when the phone rings. I don't give a fuck, you know? <laughs> no, I, I, th- I think that's the game, really. I think, I think too many people get caught up on, like, uh, on like some shit. Like, it is weird having a podcast. I, have to, I daily have to talk to sponsors like that. They're like, how many listeners? Who's on your show? Blah, blah. Like, what? The same fucking three questions over and over and over and over again. They don't care about content. They don't care about anything good. You need to show with, like, four. You need to show with, like, t- a couple people you could vibe with. Because, like, you, you naturally just going fucking kills. And I think if you had a show of, like, some like, like, like-minded peers and shit, like you, you, you're, you, I mean, if you were doing the podcast route, that would kill. If you had like two, two or three other people on the same like kind of like field as you, you know, like. Well, that that's what this guy wants you to do. I think it'd kill. But it's still a question of corralling people, you know, and like, unless yeah. you get a producer, and then you know they come and do it, and they get bored. So you know, we'll see. You know, it it is interesting, and you know, it is true that once you get yakking around a microphone with a few people, it's it's always fun. It can't it can't not be fun, but. uh but it, 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 there's, there's so many unknowns, you know, it's really crazy. And it, it, That's true. Nothing worse like uh, like going on a radio program in the morning. When you're working around the country and you go on this show and you walk in and the guy says hello and you say, hey, how you doing? And you smile and you look over and you realize you're talking to a wall. <laughs> you know, Rodney, Rodney Dangefield uses, I can't do the, I can't do the mic. What, what was his name? Mike... Uh, uh, the daytime talk show. He's, I can't do that, Mike, whatever show. He's like talking to fucking cardboard. And I'm talking to him, and he's like looking over my shoulder. He doesn't have a fucking brain in his head, you know? And I know what he's talking about. You know, you you can't play tennis against a padded wall. You just can't, you know? Yeah. Unless you unless you start fucking with the other person. <laughs> That's true. But, no. you, but you ain't coming back, you know? No, I miss I miss that shit when it's like so hard to get canceled. You can just roast people, and like no one cared. You know, I I miss that about ten years ago. That was fun. Like I, now, like they'll find every uh, you're racist, you're homophobic, you're sexist, you're rah, you know, they got like all these fifteen different fucking words they cheapened by fucking calling everybody. But it's weird. Like, uh, who, who is it? Do do guests make you nervous sometimes? Like you have like a huge fucking guest. You're like you're like you're like oh fuck, I better not fuck this up or like, type shit. Like uh, was that weird for you? Like getting these huge fucking guests at first? Oh, on the Stern show? Yeah, yeah. When you guys start doing the interviews and stuff. No, well, you know, Howard from the very beginning said, uh, "Don't ever edit," because I didn't, I didn't say much. I just wrote really funny things for him to say. There's still people that don't even know I was doing that, <clears throat> and I'd write stuff for him to say, or we'd write questions, and he'd say, "Don't edit yourself. I'll edit. You just put it up there, and if I want to use it, I'll use it, and if I want to skip it, I'll skip it." And he was brilliant at it. Um, and there's so many examples, like, but um, we'd have people, that, but there were, it really was, he pulled very little punches, and sometimes me or Fred would come up with a really outrageous question, but he would use it, he'd ask it, because it was funny, and it would throw, you know, one of the things, God, I, I, I'll send you a copy of my autobiography if you want it, you got to email me your street address. No, but, can you autograph it? Yeah, sure. And there was a I running know. thing where every time we, I don't, I started it, but I, I don't know exactly how it happened. But if we had a, a a TV personality or a porn star, no matter who, what, no matter what girl was on, if the girl said, "Oh yeah," and then my boyfriend did this, or then I went to my husband and did this, Howard, I'd write it down. How would say, "White guy," and it was always interesting reaction. Like, yeah, white guy, or of course a white guy. Like, or, you know, that, the reaction would always be weird. And after like 12 years of this, we had on this girl who was, I always, I never can remember because I'm too old, but she played not Wonder Woman, but one of those early, the girl who was from Australia. And she, it was like a Wonder Woman type character and whatever it was, and she came in and she started talking and she said, yeah. And then me and my boyfriend and Howard said, white guy. And she said, <laughs> no, how'd you, she was secretly married to a black guy and nobody knew it. And she must've thought that he had inside information. It's like we had been throwing shit against the wall for 12 years. All of a sudden she goes, no, how'd you know that? And Howard looked at me like, holy shit. You know, it, was, it was so funny. What the hell was the name of the show? That's not the Wonder Woman. The, 
Uh, somebody, will, somebody will call. Now, where are you in Missouri? St. Louis? I'm, I'm a little bit outside of St. Louis. I'm in the suburbs, like basically. Wow. Have, wow. You, been, have you been through Missouri outside of St. Louis and stuff? Uh, well, Knoxville was Tennessee, but I know we drove. So that, that's got to be close to St. Louis, right? Yeah, yeah. Tennessee is pretty close. Um, no, I think just the guy, I think I did the funny bone three times and maybe, you know, maybe some peripheral shows. There might've been some college gigs that went along with it or whatever. And, uh, aside from that, I, I know I drove through St. Louis in 1966 after I graduated from high school, me and my friends stole my family car and went across the country. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we had certain things we had to do. Like, you know, we had to see the St. Louis arch and we had to see the golden gate bridge and we had to, you know, yeah, and that, I remember that was very exciting, but uh, you know, it didn't do anything except just fucking lie there. So how exciting is that? You know? Oh, I know. I know. Oh, I oh, we went. We went. To, actually, went to a St. Louis Cardinals baseball game. That's badass. I, I, like the, I like the Cardinals a lot, but no, yeah, St. I, I lived in St. Louis City for before this whole pandemic thing happened, and uh, and like people would just fucking drive here to stare at the arch. That shit always made me laugh. It's the same way. Like you're in New York, so it's the same thing. If like you heard, I went to go see the Statue of Liberty or something. You know, it's like it's like something you just take for granted. You're like, yeah, it's there, but I mean, I would, I, I don't know if I would drive across whatever to see it. You know, it's like it's, it's a funny concept. There's so many fucking people love that shit. They love that. Like, no. You know, I actually, uh, I, I actually had the idea on the table, and there's a couple people considering it. You know, all I know is jokes, and I know every joke in the world, and they're really funny. And but all I got to do is come up with ways to couch it. And I got an idea for a travel show that's got nothing to do with traveling. I just want to stand <laughs> in front of every national place and tell a dirty joke. I want to tell a dirty joke in front of the St. Louis Arch and in front of the Grand Canyon and in front of the Golden Gate Bridge, and you know what I mean. That's great, For actually. For no other reason except it's just stupid. And like you said, people just want to see it. Yeah, yeah. You know? that's, yeah, fame, fame plus humor plus, plus a, a decent background. Yeah, that's genius, honestly. I, I like your joke documentary idea, too. I mean, it was like you, that's, you probably got something with that. It was like with your, with your um, Rolodex and shit, you could probably go through all these comedians you know and shit like that and get like big names and shit. And then, and then you get like fucking three big names. You have everybody else. And then like you literally can push this. Everybody telling a joke, whatever the concept is. That's well, actually... I, as we're good. talking, they did a documentary on me that's just, uh, it's just as the documentary got finished, the pandemic hit. So huh. we've just been waiting and waiting. So right now, in fact, I got an email from my buddy who produced it a couple of days ago uh, of all the festivals that it's entered into. Because what I want to do is not just show the doc, I want to do the documentary, but then stand there and do Q&A so I can answer questions like I'm answering your questions. Because yeah. people all across the country, they all have questions about the show. And to be there, instead of a stand-up comedy show, you know I'm going to tell some dick jokes anyway. <laughs> and the documentary is great. It's got, <coughs> it's got uh, Penn Gillette and Willie Nelson and Mark Cuban and Artie Lang and Stuttering John. And it's, you know, it, it's just fun, you know, and everybody's, you know, I'm sitting there telling jokes with Willie Nelson and his bus. What's more fun killer. than that? You Fucking know? killer. That's no, killer. That's awesome, man. I love it. And you, if you had already started a podcast, it would kill. Like if you, Wait, if you, you know, I, uh, I did, he, he had a show on direct TV that I did three or four times. It was always fun. And then he had a podcast and I did that three or four times. He actually did the, uh, forward to my in, autobiography. In yeah, yeah. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. He, he's such a good guy. You know, he's laying low. You know, I hope he's all right. You know, you, never, sure. know. you never know. It's crazy, he, but. He was on right after you, right? Like you guys didn't crawl. You guys weren't on the same time, were you? He was on right after you. <clears throat> no, 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 no. Uh, I left the show in March of two thousand one, and he started after nine eleven. Oh, okay. It was, it was it was many months. People were like, oh, it's good to see you and already getting along again. So what are you talking about? You uh -huh. know, we had never we were never not friends, and there was no crossover at all. You know, they tried a hundred people in my chair before you know before they got to Artie. You know. No, I think yeah, it's it's interesting because you're both funny. It, it's not it's not like uh, it's not like people are like, oh fuck Artie or fuck Jackie. It's like you're both funny. And like uh, I I think it kind of my my perception of it, it kind of went downhill after after Artie left. I mean I mean after you left, it went downhill. Then they, I think Artie kind of saved it a little bit. And then like I don't I don't really I, I think Stern is just on. No one has uh no one's gone up against him because they don't have the balls or the following or the fucking whatever. So so, so he's he's gonna be there until he fucking dies. Probably <laughs> he's gonna be sitting in that fucking chair until he until he fucking dies. Yeah, like, or people. Something. Forever, people have been saying, is he going to retire? When is he going to retire? And I said, listen, I would bet my house that the day that Howard dies, 
he will have been on the radio that morning unless he's on <laughs> unless he's on vacation. And that's looking more and more like that could happen, you know. But uh, because that's what he that's what he lives for. He's like a comic, you know. You kill twenty three hours a day, so you know. I think that was even the name of one of Jerry Seinfeld's stand up specials, like uh, uh, "How to Kill Twenty Three Hours" or something like that. You know? That's hilarious. It's crazy. That's no, it's a funny concept. There, everybody thinks like comedy is like so hard and shit. I mean, it is if you're not confident. If you can't fucking talk to people, you're going to have a bad time. And I think that's most people's fears, like public speaking. But once you get past that, it's like pre it's pretty much the easiest job of all time. I, I, like, it's, it's literally, you know what I mean? It's not like a fucking, like I'm building a house or anything. You know, it's like I'm not like I'm fucking putting out fires, you know. Or, you know it's just like. You know, it's so funny, though. If you read about people, you know, I said, uh, one of the things I said on this podcast that I tried to do, and I'm going again tomorrow, see what's happening. I said, uh, I want to, you know, I like talking to people like show business people of any kind, because I want to know not what they did last week or what their plans are coming up. I want to know what, what gave them the bug to face the wrong way. That's basically what we're doing is everybody's facing this way and we're facing that way. And I, and then I said to the girl that, that was the cameraman, I said, listen, in my mind and all our minds, we're not facing the wrong way. Everybody else is facing the wrong way, you know, but that's a whole thing. And trying to figure out where that emanates is so elusive, you know, but if you read like general, like there was the movie general Patton and any of these generals, these guys will take a sword and walk into enemy fire and not even break a sweat. But the thought of getting up and addressing 300 people in an auditorium, they shit themselves which is so funny. But, you know, you can't tell somebody what they're scared of and what they're not scared of. That's not how it works. It's like telling somebody, what do you mean that's not funny? That is funny. If it's not funny to them, it's not funny. You know, and it's, and it's, and it's subjective. Every single person is the, like people say, oh, Jackie, here's an old joke. Or Jackie, here's a street joke. And I say, listen, that is so insulting to the world because there's no such thing as an old joke. A joke... If I tell you a joke that you never heard before, that's a new joke. If I tell you a joke you have heard before, that's an old joke to you. And that holds with every joke for every single person. There could be three people stand there and I can tell a joke and somebody can say, that's an old joke. But if the other two people haven't heard it, it's a new joke. There's no such, no such thing as an old joke. It's just that they heard it already. You know, and my, I'm, I'm lucky because I, I sell them well. I, I, so many people come up and say, I can't believe I laughed so fucking hard at the joke about such and such. And just as you were finishing it and I'm laughing, I said, what am I laughing at? I fucking heard him tell that five times before, which is, which is great. You know, like, why are you clapping for Mickey Mantle hitting a home run? He hit one yesterday. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's no, I, yeah, there's such a weird fucking stigma to comedy. Like, uh, you, know, you told, you fucking, you, you definitely nailed that. And, and yeah, it was like, uh, my friend Jeff, he's, he's always trying to tell me to use everyone else's jokes and car and like, and be the first comedian just to rip off everyone's jokes and admit it. And like, <laughs> he was like, tell me to do shit. And then I think that's kind of rebellious and funny, but like, I, I mean, it's not my style, but it's more his style. But it's just, I, I think it's funny. It's like, they're like, uh, well, I want to do something that's never been done before. I'm like, well, like, well okay, well, comedy's already been done. <laughs> Like, yeah. It's like, it's like, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, there are people that steal routines and, and steal bits. And, yeah, that's stealing. But, but usually the essence of what's really funny, you know, when we first started, uh, people used to say, oh, that guy from Long Island tells the old jokes. Oh, he tells the old jokes. But I take them and make them my own and make them really work. <clears throat> and there were nights I'd go and see somebody having trouble with their stuff on stage, and all of a sudden they'd, tell one of the jokes that I tell, but they would tell it exactly like I tell it with the, the same everything. To me, that's as much stealing as anything that, cause that, yeah. that was, that's the way I crafted it. You know what I mean? It's uh, it sounds weird, but it's, it's really true. You know, um, and, and people know if they're stealing or not stealing and you know, it's, and it's really tough. In the old days, you know, like someone told a joke in, in, in Vancouver and somebody else is telling it in Miami and no had, nobody had any way of knowing. You know, and there's so many stories about that, which is funny. But in the days of what, you know, Burns and Allen, they toured for 15 years with the same seven minutes. 
15 years, oh they told the God. same seven minutes, five or six or seven times a day for 15 years. The Marx Brothers toured for 15 years. They, the, the reason they became so crazy is because they were doing the same shit over and over and over and over. They did that for 15 years before they made a movie. Nobody knows that. Nobody, That's well, true. You know, comics know that. But, you know, they're, they're, of course they're wacky. Jesus Christ, you know. Yeah, I, th I think I smoke too much weed to do the same thing every day. Like, I, feel, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think it's always like a comedian that doesn't smoke weed or something. Like, like that, that can even do that, be, do the same thing over and over. That would fucking be crazy. But, I mean, it worked for the Marx Brothers. They're legends, though. I mean, it worked for these people. But it's just, I guess there's a million ways up the fucking mountain, you know? I mean, to each their own. But it's just, I couldn't imagine doing that. I always like write jokes. I, I spend so much time writing jokes and I don't even use any of them. And I just do whatever the fuck I want. It's like, I, I like prep, 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 and then just do whatever the fuck I want. It makes no sense. Like ever. Well, they, they all wind up being uh, shuffled in the hard drive and you, you, you will get to them. You know, for years, <clears throat> you know, I, I tell jokes, but I always have comments on them and side number. And for years and years and years, I would tell, do my act. And on my way home, I would listen to my cassette or my micro cassette or whatever. And if I thought of something funny as a tagline, I would write it down as I was driving and make, and I have two huge boxes full of comments and taglines that I never have ever had time to look at. And once in a while at random, I'll look at one. I'm like, holy fuck. You know, that's very funny because you know, when you're in the heart of your act, you know, I don't know how, how long you've been doing this, but I used to record with a micro cassette recorder. And it was really good because a micro cassette recorder has a, it, the, the recording system is, has a limiter. So if I say something to you and you just go, ha, 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 it pulls it up. So it sounds like you're roaring. And so even if you weren't having a great show, you, if two people laugh, it sounds like you're doing great. <laughs> but whenever you had an ad lib, <clears throat> very times when you tell an ad lib, use an ad lib, you don't have the confidence in the line like you do when you're telling a joke. So you'd be like, Two Jews go into the bar and they buy it. You know, that's something they always put back. And you kind of tell it. And then you listen back to the micro cassette and you hear the crowd roar, but you can't fucking understand what you said. I have so many jokes that I played it back 20 times that all right, I give up. I have no idea what the fuck I said, you know. Uh, well, yeah, it's really it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, when people get excited, like when I get excited, I'll talk fast too. No, I totally understand that. It's like, and that, and it, that, I think you nailed you nailed a lot of interesting things that I think well, not a lot of people talk about like in comedy. I think it's interesting. Like, uh, like yeah, you nailed a lot of good concepts, man. Um, well, do you want to throw any promo before you get on or anything? Like any like social media or any? I mean, you got a book, you got a fucking, you got a bunch of shit going on. Like, well, uh, my book is uh, for sale on Amazon, and it's the joke man bow to Stern. But you can't go on bow to Stern because if you order bow to Stern, you get a seventh grade sailing manual. Okay. <laughs> it's the joke man, bow to Stern. And I have my old book from 20 years ago, uh, the disgustingly dirty joke book, which is maybe the best joke book there ever was. And, um, I do cameo.com slash Jackie Martling. I've got like a 105 five star reviews. They're always home runs. And it's, some, you know, uh, I'm getting my friends getting divorced. We do this. I, I've had so many. One guy, he, he said, uh, I'm paying you double. I want you to record a shitload of jokes that they can play at my funeral. He <laughs> said, but don't get excited. I'm only 40 years old. It's just I want to know I have this. So when I'm lying in my casket, somebody can play your jokes, which I, I, and he sounded, I think he was on the level, which is very, very funny, you know. And of course, I want one for my ex wife. So, Go to cameo.com slash Jackie Martling. All my gigs are on my website, which is jokeland.com. There's not a shitload of stuff on there, but there's, there's a bunch of jokes. But all the gigs are listed there. And, um, geez, I would, I would love to come back to St. Louis. It's been a long fucking time. Now, we, well, we, we were on in St. Louis, right? That was one of our markets. Oh yeah, yeah, yo! You were the you were the show that um uh, uh the, I was a kid, I was a child when uh whenever you guys were uh, uh in the prime and stuff. So I'm like I'm like fucking thirty four. So when I was a kid, um the school bus would play a really fucking shitty morning show because everyone's afraid of your morning show. So I like to listen to the Howard Stern show. You'd have to get like a uh, like one of those radios and like headphones to listen to what you wanted to, rather than this fucking shitty fucking morning show they made us listen to instead. Because you guys were everybody was so afraid of you guys, man. They're afraid of what you guys might say or do or whatever. I mean. Uh, Espe what, especially in the midwest right oh yeah no definitely brother like that's crazy well dude thanks for coming on man i appreciate it for real 
you know, there was a guy who came on the radio show. Uh, somebody hooked me up with him. He's a guy who does animation. He's so talented. This guy, Rich Dresden. And he brought his sister who, after she came on the show, she wound up being one of the main writers for Saturday Night Live for a couple of years. Her name was Anna Dresden. But the okay. two of them loved me because when they were kids, when they were like 10 years old, they stole my joke book from their father's <sighs> desk. And on the way to camp, them and all the kids would read the jokes. But most of them, they had no fucking idea what they meant. And everybody would take it like a homework assignment to come back the next day and say what a blowjob is or, or, or <laughs> what anal sex. Oh, God, it's just so funny. It's the same thing. Like everybody's, everybody's hiding, you know. Listen, this was great fun. Email me your street address, Anthony. I'll send you an autographed joke book. I mean, an autographed autobiography. I know you'll love it. And you people in St. Louis or wherever the fuck you are, <laughs> uh, I answer all my own emails and I get a kick out of it. Jokeland at AOL.com. J-O-K-E-L-A-N-D at AOL.com. And, the, you know, one thing I do on social media is I, I tweet a joke every day at 4.20 p.m. International Marijuana Time. Just one joke every day on at Jackie Martling. But, of course, there's, it goes back 12 years, so you can, you can sit there and read a gazillion jokes, you know. So that's fun. So th this was fun, and really good luck with your career. You too, and, man. Uh, get me a gig out there. I'll come out, and if you're in – you come to New York, uh, email me, and I'll say hello. This episode is brought to you by Blum Loco. They're a family company. Uh, they make small batches of seasoning, salts, gourmet chocolates, and snack mixes. Go to BlumLoco.com. Link in the description and buy some stuff while you listen to this episode.